I've been going back and forth all week with the idea of talking about faith, and then all of a sudden I, start, I started putting something on my heart about peace, and I'm like, well, faith, peace, and he's like, don't separate them. <laughs> you can't have one without the other operating properly. And so I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about faith. I want to break some things down kind of practically right up front, and then we're going to go into this part on peace that I think is going to absolutely be a breakthrough. I feel like, though, there's a lot of people in the room that need a breakthrough this morning, and we're going to get there, but um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scripture in John chapter, I think John chapter 20, that talks about when the disciples, when Jesus and I didn't write this down because it wasn't in my sermon, but when Jesus had been crucified, there's a, ch- there's a chapter in a scripture that talks about on the second day that the disciples went and locked themselves in a room. And it said they were fearful of Jewish leaders and they're scared. And I was thinking about this, this, what this would look like because we know the end of the story, right? <laughs> We know, but I want you to look at this from their perspective for a moment. Like everything they put their hope in, everything they had known, their leader in their eyes was dead. I mean, they had went out there, they had followed him, they had done everything that he said. And I mean, they were going with him and then all of a sudden, he's dead. And they're scared. Because we know the story, it's not as scary to us. But they're scared. And I felt like Jesus, I kept, I kept hearing this word day two, day two. There's so many people in day two. They're in that place where like, you know, they've stood in faith, they've believed, they've followed, they've done what they know to do. And now it's like things don't look real good. Come on, help me out now. You've done what you know to do. And you did good. And now you're in day two. And I felt like he said, though, this morning, there's going to be a breakthrough to day three. And I, 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 here's the reality. We will, all, we will continue through life. We will have day twos. I'm not going to lie to you and say you get to live in day three forever. I, I hope you get to live in day three as long as and as much as you can. But there are, there are times where things just don't feel good and they're challenging. But I believe that he's going to do something this morning. It's going to be a breakthrough that's actually corporate. Like I feel a really corporate breakthrough. And... These, these disciples, <laughs> I imagine they were pretty scared for their lives. Like everything they'd poured in to this, the king that they thought, and he came completely different than they thought he would. I mean, they thought he was going to come and do this and do this and do this, and he didn't do, any, he didn't do any of the things pretty much they listed off. He came in meek and humble. <laughs> But what I want to talk to you about is what this faith and this peace looks like. But I want to talk about aggressive faith and aggressive peace. That word is scary because so many people have misused it. But I do believe there's an aggressive faith and I believe there's an aggressive peace. And I, so think, I think so often when we talk about faith and peace, if I were to say he's such a faith guy, people are like, oh, he's like a science, wonders, and miracles guy. He's like, oh. And then, like, we have, like, this idea of the peace. Like, he's got so much peace. It's like, oh, he just chills. <laughs> Even culture has set, like, a, a picture for peace. You know, like, the whole hippie thing. And, you know, it's like, my, my son used to watch this movie called Cars. I don't know if anyone else knows what I'm talking about. I watched it at least probably 10,000 times when he was, yeah, you know what I'm talking about back there. I mean, and before he could even talk, he'd be like, Dad, let's watch Kachow. I'm like, oh, here we go again. You turn it on and ka-chow, ka-chow. And, and there's this one car on the movie that's like this hippie van. <laughs> and he's like, yo, what's up, bro? Peace. And I often think we get this idea of like, I'm just so filled with peace. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it manifests in different ways that might look like rest. But I want to talk what actually these two look like because I think that we think like peace is like this just, uh, and sometimes peace is aggressive. Sometimes peace does some very aggressive stuff that's powerful. And the way that I would describe our church to somebody, if somebody come up and I, and I have it all the time, hey, tell me about your church, you know, tell me about your worship. And that's always hard when people ask me that about our church. I'm like, <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a band 
There's this lady in the middle that's super hot. <laughs> She's my wife. And let me just say, you guys got an amazing worship pastor in this house. I'll take her any day of the week. I've heard a lot of great worship pastors, but she's got it going on, man. I mean it. I mean, I've heard a lot of worship pastors, and I'll take her, man. She's just got, she's got it going. But I believe, I believe in, I, I would often tell people, okay, you got spirit-filled churches. Let's take that, like, over the cliff to spirit-led churches. Mm. But then you have to understand what spirit-led means. I don't think all of us often understand what spirit-led means. And so I want to just kind of dive into that because we have this incredible privilege of having the Holy Spirit in us. What an incredible privilege. And holy is not like Holy Spirit's first name. It's not like John, meet holy. (laughs) It's not his first name, okay? So... The Holy Spirit is just so interesting because we get to have the Spirit of God in us. And so I think about scriptures like 1 Peter 1.16 that say things like, be holy as I am holy. One of the most misunderstood scriptures because people automatically put on their, their hat of, what do I have to do to be holy like you? Which means you've completely missed it. Because be holy as I am holy, it didn't say do something to get holy as I am holy. It said be holy as I am holy. You are a human being, not a human doing. So you have to understand when he says be holy as I am holy, it's not as hard as you think because you have this amazing thing called the Holy Spirit, which is his spirit that abides in you. And when you have the spirit of God, which is holy in you guess what you are holy as he is this is good news if you actually believe me all right i know i know it's really great to like sometimes we have a comfort in feeling like it's almost like guilt comforts us sometimes it's easier to live in that but this is so freeing when you understand when you receive that holy spirit like when he said it was done on the cross here i'm gonna blow your mind it was done That's like all I talk about is what's done. Well, what do I have to do? Why do you keep wanting to do something? Either his sacrifice was sufficient or it wasn't. When you feel like you have to do something to get you somewhere that he already said you were, that means that he didn't do a good enough job and I have to help out. He said, you are holy. Be holy as I am holy. How does that happen? His Holy Spirit abides in us. If, if someone, let's say we've got a father and his name, well, let's name him Joe. And we got Joe. And Joe's just a really kind guy. You know, he's got a sweet spirit. And every time you're around him, he's like, man, that guy's just so nice. And you find, oh, Joe's got kids. Oh, and then you meet like his kids. And you meet this one kid, uh, her name's Jenny. And when you meet Jenny, you're like, oh, she's got her dad's spirit on her. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, that's sweet, kind. She's just got her daddy's spirit. You have your daddy's spirit. So that when people see you, they say, oh, oh, it's just so, wow, you're holy, just like your daddy. We're going to go somewhere with this. You with me? Our Father has a Holy Spirit. When we come into the family, we get the same Holy Spirit. So this, this, this Holy Spirit from our Father abides in our spirit. Our spirits are the place that we connect with God. And as we mature in being aware of our spirit, we become what's called spirit-led. I'm going to walk you through this kind of practically, and then we're going to jump into the peace part. But as we mature in awareness of what's happening in our spirit, man, we begin to become spirit-led. And when we become spirit-led, then here's what's cool. We begin to operate a lot in faith. Romans 10, verse 17 
passage that we're all pretty familiar with most likely. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith comes by hearing. Everybody say hearing. hearing. Faith does not come by having heard. Amen. I want you to get this. Faith does not come from past tense heard. This is really interesting because faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come, say that faith comes by knowing. It doesn't even say necessarily that it comes by experiencing, even though it is an experience. It said that faith comes by hearing. Another way that you could say hearing would be listening. That word makes more sense for us when I say that faith comes by listening. How do I be filled with faith? Listen. Listen. Just, just kind of let it sit there for a minute because when your heart is in a posture of... When your heart is in a posture of listening, you actually position yourself for this deposit of faith. I'm going to say that again. When your heart is in the position of listening, what you do is you posture yourself to receive faith. Those that listen get faith. Have you ever, have you ever read a scripture in the Bible like 200 times and it never grabbed you and then all of a sudden you had this, this great time with the Lord. You started reading your Bible, you know. Listen, always get in the presence before you read the Bible. Just, just even if it's really quick, just get in the presence. And you open it up and you'd be like, consequently, faith comes from hearing. Faith comes from hearing. And all of a sudden what happens sometimes is you've read over it a, a hundred times. What happens? Something in your spirit was listening. You were in a posture of listening. Do you read your Bible by listening? Do you read your Bible in the posture of listening? You ever had a conversation with someone and you know they're not listening to you and it's not going well? <laughs> First of all, let me say that annoys me. Second of all, let me say I am one of the worst people at doing that. And so I apologize to you in advance if I've ever done that or been passed because my mind is... Con and let me say, if you have a conversation with me before I preach, you better tell me again after church because I probably won't remember any of it because my mind is on like the sermon before I preach. And so often people are talking and I'm like, I'm feeling a connection, but I don't, I'm not really hearing very well. I'm like, this is sweet, cool, great. I feel like sometimes we read our Bibles like that. It's like, do you sit down with the posture of, okay, I'm going to listen to this. It would be better that you read one scripture listening than a whole book without. Because something happens when you position yourself that way. So this idea of faith changes everything. Faith is actually revealing to us faith reveals the unseen realm Hebrews 11 and I have to go to the, a certain Bible translation for this oh I'm already there Hebrews 11 amen Hebrews 11 verse 1 hey our babies feel stuff <laughs> Hebrews 11 ver verse 1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for everybody say substance <laughs> Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is a really interesting scripture. I want, I want to try to break it down really practical. A lot of places that we eat around town now, they have like kind of an in-between of fast food but dining. And what they do is you go up, right, and you order, and they give you a number. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You take that number, you've paid, you've picked out your food, you put that number on your table. Are you with me still? If someone were to walk up to me and say to me, hey, why are you just sitting there? You're not going to get any food. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to point to my number. <laughs> say, it's my number. Well, they could say, well, well just because you have that number doesn't mean that you're still going to get your food. How do I know that you didn't just pick up that number? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show them the receipt that has been paid for. Some of you guys are ahead of me. 
I could take this so far and I don't have time. <sighs> so when my food is ready to be served and the waiter or the waitress comes, what are they doing? They're looking for that number. Walk with me. That number is the substance of something that I'm hoping for. When heaven is looking to release things from heaven, the riches that Paul talks about, and all these things he's looking to release on you, heaven is drawn to faith. What does that mean? There is faith, faith is looking for that number. That number at my table is the substance of something that I'm hoping for. You can't come up to me and tell me, you didn't pay for your phone. I'm like, dude, get the number. Back off. <laughs> it's the substance. How does the product, and it's probably a bad word, but let's just call it that. How does the product of heaven know where to go? It's looking for faith. It's looking for faith. I'm going to give you some scriptures in a moment. Remember when Jesus was going down the street and the two blind men were calling out to him to get healed? Yep. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. If you want to write that down, Matthew 9, 27. He's walking down the street, and they're like, Jesus, heal us. And everybody's like, shh, shh. You can make a fool of yourself. Aggressively. What happens? They get healed. What did Jesus accredit it to? Your faith. Heaven saw their number and said, I've got something to give to you. Amen. Remember the lady with the issue of blood? This is just one of the coolest stories in your Bible. The lady had been hemorrhaging for many, 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 many years, and there was, Jesus was coming through town, and it's crowded, and she just wants to get to Jesus, right? And she's got this cool, like, understanding, all I have to do is touch him. I don't need him to, I don't need a big, long, drawn-out prayer. I just need to touch him. Now, what I love about this one is we get to see a picture of heaven operating through Jesus, and it was like Jesus was almost, I can't say he was unaware, but he sure responded in a way like, who just touched me? What happened? She comes, she gets a hold of the hem of his garment, and she touches it, and what happens? The substance of faith directed healing from heaven through Jesus to her, and Jesus says, who touched me? Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of cool. If you think about it from the position that all she needed to do was with faith get before him. And heaven said, I'll release the rest. This is powerful. When we learn how to operate in faith, everything in the, na in the, in the natural begins to shift. We begin to operate from the invisible to the visible. Our faith, let me say it this way, our faith actualizes what it realizes our faith actualizes something that it realizes what does that mean it, it takes something that is realized and it releases it are you still with me I know I'm dropping a whole lot on you and there's a lot more to come so hang in there go watch the YouTube or something by the way hi to everybody watching the YouTube this faith, is, this faith is aggressive. It has a purpose. It has a focus. It will violently grab hold of truth. And it releases it into the storm with no fear. But something we need to learn about aggressive faith is aggressive faith doesn't mean loud and harsh. The enemy is wise enough to know the difference between someone operating from faith that is being aggressive versus someone that is hiding inadequacies by being loud and harsh. I meet some people that are loud and harsh and wear the right t-shirt and wear the right things and say the right things. And I'm like, hmm. Something's just not right. And then I meet people, and I'm not saying you can't be loud. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can't be loud either. I'm, I'm often very loud, so. My... I'm half like, I'm like Italian and Irish. I have no chance of really being, it's really amazing I'm this nice, really, with Italian and Irish, you know? I obviously don't look like the Italian side. <laughs> I 
But I can, I have some people that have come up to me, they're quiet, and they're so, hum- I just feel they're quiet, and they speak something, I'm like, whoa. And I can feel like an aggressive faith in them, but they're quiet. They're not brash, but they're powerful. And there's an aggressive faith that we can step into that changes everything. And the devil knows the difference between the two. You can fool people, but you can't fool him. Remember when they tried to cast out devils and he's like, wait a minute, hmm, who are you? Because you're not on my list of people to be worried about. <laughs> like, like, you're saying the right stuff, you're yelling really loud, which you don't have to do to cast out devils. Another teaching. And, but who are you? He knows. But see, he's also scared to death of a child who's confident in who their father is that will quietly just walk up and say, I don't think so. Not happening on my watch. (laughs) And so there's this peace, there's this understanding with faith that it tracks heaven. It's, it's that number that we get to carry. I, people are always like, why does that person always have stuff happening to them? They get all the prophetic words. Every, every time they come to church, I haven't got anything. <laughs> are you listening? Because when you listen and you begin to posture your heart to listen, you begin to become spirit-led. Here's the thing. You want to become to the point where you're, and I'm not saying this to degrade the mind, don't get me wrong, but your mind should be your, a student of your heart. Yeah. The mind should be a student of your heart. I see the difference sometimes where my mind wants to begin to take over, and I don't listen to my heart. You ever met someone, and like you're like, they're so cool, and it's like your heart's like, there's something wrong there. But they're so cool. <laughs> and your, your heart's like, ah, but bro, they're amazing. And then we have the other side where you ever met someone all of a sudden your heart just like came to life when you're around like, what? I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. But when I'm around you, I just, I can't explain what I feel in my heart. And your mind hasn't quite got it yet. You see the difference? Between uh, your mind learning to become a student of your heart versus your heart, your mind fighting with your heart. See, God has this beautiful plan that they would all actually work together. Like, like they actually can all work together. We have a bad tendency to make people that are smart feel stupid because we often think that if you're smart, you can't experience the things of the kingdom because you can't listen to your head. You just have to listen to your heart. That's not true. Your heart and your mind can, in this beautiful picture of when he says, be renewed by the transforming of your mind, means that your mind can be transformed and you can actually see this harmony that begins to work between your heart and your mind. You with me? I know I'm going fast. Okay, let's transition now. We're going to get into fun stuff. I want to talk to you about this part with peace. Often the missing element with faith is actually peace. I meet a lot of people that have a high value for faith, but they don't always have as high value for peace. Because they're like, they've they've put an interpretation on peace. It's like, you understand, I gotta go out and win the world. I don't have time for that peace stuff. (laughs) Like, there are people dying. I don't have time for peace. And they've almost, they completely don't understand what peace is. And so I'm learning things, and I can't tell you that I've, I've, I've learned all of this, but this morning I began to learn the differences between translation and transliteration. This is a Jordan topic. <laughs> and I was studying on this topic of peace, and there was someone that, that had done a lot of research, and they gave a definition to the word shalom that I, I really grabbed onto. I heard this through Danny Silk, so if it's wrong, I'm blaming Danny. <laughs> But I did, I did research it before I brought this up. And this, this, this trans, it's called a transliteral definition. Are you ready? 
That's the biggest word I've ever said when I preached. Transliteral definition of shalom is this, to destroy the authority that establishes chaos. Now, I would like to change one word in that because I don't believe that the enemy has authority. I believe that the enemy has power because it said that the Lord took away all of the authority. So I want to tweak one word because I feel like that would be wrong. I believe it's to destroy the power that establishes chaos. Isn't that powerful? Matthew chapter 10, I want you to go to this one, or excuse me, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. You're getting something back there, aren't you? <laughs> Luke chapter 10, verse 5 says this, and this is the Lord. He's speaking, and he's talking to his disciples, and he says, but whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. This is interesting. And if a son of peace is there, your peace, this is Jesus talking to the disciples, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. I'll read it again. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to the house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. What's happening here? The Lord's talking to his disciples and he's teaching them about this concept of peace. And he says, when you walk into a home, release peace into the atmosphere. And it will, as that scripture, as that definition just said, it will challenge the atmosphere. And it will challenge the power of anything that's not peace. We see an example of this with Jesus, with the storm. Right? The one we all know. It seems like he would have said a hundred different things than peace. I mean, I'm thinking of a, like a chaotic moment in my house. I'm a father, right? I got kids, and sometimes I got a lot of other kids in my home. I'm, my, my initial thing is usually like, guys, quiet. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Make me feel better, because you're looking at me like, what a terrible dad. <laughs> I came home yesterday. We'd come up here and done some work at the church, and it was outdoor work, and it was hot. And I got home, and I loved it because my little nephew was over, and my kids were there, and Vic, our kids' pastor, was here, and his daughter was there, and it was, ah! I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> I just went and laid on the floor in my living room. I tried to hide so they wouldn't see me on the couch, so I laid on the floor. And I just kind of lay there like, and I would just slowly like, guys, 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 shh. When the Lord came into that situation with the storm, I love what he did because he actually shows us what he's talking about here. That shalom. That thing where you can speak to the authority that carries chaos, and when you release peace into it, it stops it. And I don't believe he got up. I really don't believe it's like what we see on TV where he's like, peace, be still. I, I don't. I know it sounds great, but I don't wake up that way, and I don't think Jesus does. And Jesus was dead asleep. Now, he might have been a little frustrated, but I don't believe he woke up from a dead sleep and went immediately into King James language. I think he woke up and said, peace, be still. He took away the power of chaos. And so what is he teaching his disciples? He's teaching them, he says, when you walk into a home, when you walk into an atmosphere, immediately declare peace into the house. But here's the thing. If there's a son or daughter of peace, it will rest on them. If not, it will come back to you. We often confuse peace with absence of problems. Peace is not the absence of a problem. Peace is the presence of a king. Peace is not that I don't have problems. Peace is that even in the midst of what I'm having, the king of peace is here. Peace is not abs just absence of problems. Uh, uh, Romans 16.20 says that the prince of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Well, wait a minute, because I've been praying for Jesus to like stomp it under his feet for a long time. 
done deal. He said that the prince of who? Peace. Now, that sounds like a scripture. We're talking about crushing the enemy and hurrah, the prince of the armies, prince of peace. will soon crush Satan. Oh, wait, 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 under your feet. You see, when, when the prince of peace shows up, it empowers. He doesn't want to show up and just stomp the enemy and say, I took care of it for you. He wants to show up, and he wants to empower you to stomp the head of the enemy. Let's talk about the son of peace part. If you walk into the house, there's son of peace, and it will respond to the father of peace. I don't have time to teach on this, but I do believe there's a teaching within it on the apostolic. Paul talks often about the government of heaven. By the way, the government of heaven is family. I don't, it doesn't matter what you're taught. You can't get away from the government of heaven. It is family. It's the father and the son. It's the bride and the bridegroom. He has established everything in the kingdom so you can't even see it without family. Which is why it confuses me so much why churches haven't figured out that it works through family. But family can be nasty, right? It's easier just to have rules and kick people out. But family means, okay, that irritated me, but we're family. Man, I wish I had families like yours. You guys are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I'm going to show up at your house on Christmas. I'll see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thanksgiving, when all of a sudden we start talking about, oh, we're coming in the political season. We're going to see really what your families are made out of then. <laughs> the whole kingdom, and I got to watch the time here. The government of heaven is meant to work. The government of heaven is family. So there's this interesting thing here when we see the apostles. Paul was always saying things like, my son, Timothy. He operated from a fathering place in his life. My son, Timothy. Even Paul wrote in the scriptures, he said, guys, we have a problem. You have 10,000 teachers and one dad. You know what that means? You got a lot of people that can teach you who you're going to be, but where's the people like the dads that are going to empower you to be what they're talking about? See, I, I love teachers. Teachers, I love getting around them. They talk, I'm like, oh man, that's good. That's who I could be. But I love the father that's like, then do it. Let's do it. See, I need that fathering figure. You need that fathering figure. But the problem is, is so often that we've had so many people that have kind of messed that one up and they've misused fathering. And so then we're like, well, that's just bad. I hate to tell you that he's God the Father. He kind of made it where you can't get rid of the Father piece. <laughs> to get rid of it is to get rid of him. So we're not going to get rid of fathers, which means we have to understand how they're supposed to operate. And Paul said, he said, listen, he said, you've got to understand this thing. You have 10,000 teachers, a, a, a church full of teachers. You are going to have no shortage of Bible studies. You're going to have Bible studies. You are going to learn the Bible. You're going to learn Hebrew, Greek. All of them. You're going to have all these different versions. You're going to have 54 highlighters in your Bible, all different colors, and you're going to know what you're doing. And that's amazing. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But Paul said, hey, just, just make sure you have as many fathers. Because they're going to say, they're going to teach you who you are. Your father, though, is going to empower you to be who you are called to be. I'm getting excited. I, I really think, let me just say this with apostles, because that's where I was going with this. I really do believe, that, and I, I embrace the five-fold ministry 110%. I believe that God gave these five gifts to the church. I do. All the way. And I believe there's some things in this scripture that talks about how when a father walks into a house, it says, if there's a son of peace, they'll get it. If not, it'll come back to you. We see a piece of the father-son part right there that no one really focuses on. And he's talking to his apostles. They're supposed to be father figures. If there's an apostle that doesn't feel like a father figure, I would be cautious what position you give him in your life. 
and not their definition of a father. What's the right definition of a father? Doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. I think we all have dads, and many of us are dads, and we're not perfect. But there's a difference between that and someone that's using a title for control. But you can't get around it because he said when a father walks into a house and says, peace into the house, if there's a son or daughter, it'll rest on them. Now, here's what gets interesting. Here's where this apostolic piece plays into the church. I believe that we need the apostles that can stand in corporate atmospheres and say to a group in a house, peace. And guess what? If you're a son or daughter, you catch it then guess what? You get to turn around and release it into your situation. We need the fathers. We need the apostolic grace. We just need it working properly. Peace is powerful. Peace can step into any situation, poverty, disease, sickness, oppression, oppression, dysfunction, and see its power destroyed. I'm going to wrap it up here. Peace is the missing link for a lot of people that move in signs, wonders, and miracles. All right. Help me, Jesus. Okay. You do know that you're, the gifts that God gives you are irrevocable. You meet a lot of people that have gifts that he gave them, and a lot of times they're not redeemed. They're not moving in them properly. You often meet people that are um, <laughs> okay, remember when Peter, when, when, remember when Jesus was being taken away and Peter came up, and don't we just love Peter? Peter's always sticking his foot in his mouth. I think he's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to hang with Peter when we get to heaven because he's just going to be fun. And Peter was like, they're coming to get him, and he's like, pulls his sword out, and he's like, Fuck! and thankfully he was not that great with a sword. And he took off the ear of the Roman soldier, and Jesus is like, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> Peter gets this thing like, why'd you give me a sword if you didn't want me to use it? You see, there's this peace part that Peter hadn't got a hold of. And there's this peace part that a lot of people in the church don't understand, and they got their sword. <laughs> and I see, I can see the father sometimes like, oh, Oh, my goodness. Oh, my word. God's like picking up ears all day long in the spirit realm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But what he wants to see is people that walk and operate in this peace, and they can walk into the situation and say, hey, guess what, man? Peace on you. And what happens? That shalom that takes away the power of chaos. You can walk into whatever situation it is as a child of God, and you can step into sickness, disease, pain, poverty, confusion, whatever it is, and say, peace. And it takes away the power. I'm not scared of that stuff. You shouldn't be scared of that stuff. He wants to establish the government, the government of heaven on earth. That government is family. That government is family. We've kind of gotten really confused with like thousands of denominations. What, what happens is we all, what happens in the body of Christ so often is we all gather around some things that are really important to us. And the problem, if you're not careful, and I am sure not slapping this label on everybody, but if you're not careful, when the Father reveals something new that doesn't fit inside of that thing you gathered around, you can't be a part of our group. Oh, well, then I'll go start a denomination over here that believes everything you believe plus two things. They're really that close, some of them. And we're here and we're good. 
hey, guys, like, God's showing me all this stuff. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pull it down, buddy. Well, you're out. See, family, a father says, wow, that's, I want to hear that. A family says, listen, we don't have to agree on everything to be in unity. Listen, that's marriage advice, like 101. Most, listen, I can make your marriage like 10,000 times better if you listen to that one sentence. You don't have to agree to be in unity. Now, agreement's great, and agreement's powerful, so don't just throw it out, but you can be unified and not agree on something. It pretty much happens every time me and my wife try to figure out where we want to go eat. <laughs> I like that. I don't like that. We're not like, there goes the unity. <laughs> right? It's like, all right, I'll tell you what. We'll go here for you this time. Next time we'll go there. Cool. As family. I want us to grab the power, though, of the peace that crushes Satan under your feet. When you take the faith and you take the element, let me sum up everything. When you take the element of, I'm going to get my heart to listen. I'm going to just listen. What happens is, is you begin to become spirit-led. You're connecting your heart to the spirit of the Father. When you become spirit-led, faith begins to come into play. It's like, oh, there's my faith. You ever notice you come in the presence of the Lord? If you just be quiet and listen for like two minutes, you start feeling filled with faith. There's hope. Your faith draws heaven, but there's a peace with authority. You need this thing with peace. And I can walk in a room and say, hey, you know what? Peace. Be still. Now, here's the deal. I believe with all my heart there's going to be a massive breakthrough of peace this morning that some of the stuff you're fighting, you're getting ready to crush it under your feet because the God of peace is going to show up. And God of love is, uh, we need every aspect of the Father, God of love, God of power, God of all of these. But this morning, there's a specific manifestation of the God of peace that's going to show up and it's going to heal and it's going to break through. It doesn't have to be loud and brash, but it might be loud for you whatever floats your boat but we're going to welcome him now stand up thank you Jesus thank you Father for healing hearts in here right now I want to call out to the sons and daughters of peace. I'll tell you what, before I do that, actually, let me take it a step back, and we're going to have an opportunity this morning. If you're not in relationship with the Lord, we're going to start there. Because I'd be robbing you from everything we're getting ready to do if I don't give you that opportunity. If you're in this place this morning and you say, listen, I just want to, I want to come into this relationship with the Lord. I'm not walking with the Lord. I do believe in like, I'm not going to have you bow your heads and close your, your eyes and all that because I believe that when we come in relationship with someone, if we're too embarrassed for anyone to know we're in a relationship, probably something wrong with our relationship. So I'm not going to embarrass you, but I also think that you have to just say, I I'm good, to, I want to do that. And so if you're in the room this morning and you say, listen, I want to actually just come into relationship with the Father this morning. I'm not, I I'm not walking with the Lord. If that's you. I'm going to pray over you, but I want to give you the opportunity right now to make that decision because it will absolutely change your life. So if that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at, and I will wait just a moment. Thank you, Father. I do feel like I just feel strongly there's a couple people in here. I encourage you just be bold. Be courageous. If you feel like almost nauseousness in your stomach, a lot of times that's like the Holy Spirit, like, go, go. Raise your hand. Anybody at all? Raise, just raise your hand right now. All right. Okay. All right, then we're going to move forward. 
I'll let you say something because you're my wife. <laughs> it will be in a minute. If Rachel in the back sees you, there you go. <laughs> it's coming. Check. All right. Um, I, when he was just like, when you feel that nauseous feeling, I was like, okay, it's time now. I was like, I feel it, but not. I'm saved. Just. <laughs> <laughs> We've been praying for this for a long time. Imagine what worship will be like now. <laughs> Woo, you just wait. Oh. But, you know, what I needed to say is this just as he was preaching and I was, I was listening. And, um. Before he prays for peace, I just want to address something. I just kept hearing this lie whispering, and it's not to everyone. It's not even to a lot of people, but I just felt the Lord saying to the few that it's speaking to, I want them to hear the truth. And the, just what I was hearing is just as John was talking about fathers and sons. Anytime he says father, mothers are just as important. Absolutely. And he knows that. And I just want to address that any time that we say father or that we say son, yeah. it's addressing everyone. That there's never been a day in our lives where we've ever believed that women can't be called or can't do yeah. anything that men are called to do in the kingdom. And so that's why he's never felt a need to differentiate. And so I just want to put that truth out there yeah, that any time it's father, it's mother. Anytime it's son, it's daughter. And so I just need to say that before you, you called out the sons and daughters of peace because I wanted that confusion out. That's good. Because I don't feel like you can have your peace if you're just like, is he actually talking to me? Is he actually going to value yeah, that's good. me as a woman? And so, yeah. Well, just stay up here, mama. <laughs> stay there. I'm going to let you pray in a minute too then. That's good. That's why I need a wife. She helps me. All right. Just, I want you to do, uh, the best we know how to do this, I want you to just position your heart right now to hear from the Holy Spirit because the majority of those people in this room are in relationship with the Father and His Spirit is in you. So I want you to just quiet everything around you, quiet everything around you, and listen. Let your spirit connect. See, I can feel the peace right now in the room. Just starting to fill the room, even now. So here's how we're going to do this. Just stay right where you're at. I'm going to release peace. And the sons and the daughters of peace are going to receive it. And then you're going to release it into whatever the situation is in your, li in your life. And the king of peace is going to crush Satan under your feet. So right now, Father, I thank you for everyone that's in this room. I thank you for everyone, the people I do know, the people I don't know, my friends, my family. I thank you for them. I just thank you. And I pray that right now, that the peace from heaven, the peace that when you stood on the bow of a boat and you said, still that peace we just release it in the room we just release it in the room I release it the chaos that's been in your mind this peace takes away its power it has no power Jesus already took away its authority but now this peace is taking away its power. And I say peace. 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 Now, Tiffany, why don't you release peace as well? I just speak this shalom. Yeah. That exact peace over you. In the chaos of this world, we just say shalom. We say peace. And we understand that our peace is never at the expense of someone else. 
Our peace always builds up the ones around us. It's never to cut them down. So we just rise up in our peace. We bring up those around us. We share our peace with them. We speak our peace into their house. That we are in this together. We are in this kingdom as a family. Through thick, through thin, through the chaos we speak peace. And then we have joy. Those are our seasons. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Prince of Peace. Thank you that that is who you are and who is living inside of us. What's up, everybody? We want to thank you for watching this video. We hope it really encouraged you and spoke to your heart. We are so excited about what God is doing here at the gate. We would love for you to partner with us. Just simply visit tgcgive.com. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or hit any of the links below for more updates.